All right, so we are finishing up Chapter 2, The Chemical Basis of Life. Our last section is the chemical constituents of cells. So here's where we're really going to begin to look at uh, the difference between inorganic and organic chemistry. <clears throat> the main objectives in this section are to list the major groups of inorganic chemicals that are common in our cells and explain the functions of each of those groups. And then we're also going to describe the general functions of the main classes of organic molecules in cells. So this would be a basic review of biology uh, when we did our, our, our chapters on basic chemistry and then biochemistry. So it should be a refresher. So as far as uh, chemical constituents of cells, we know that there are inorganic substances that include water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and inorganic salts. Inorganic substances uh, generally do not contain that carbon and hydrogen, but as you can see in carbon dioxide, there you have a carbon atom. In water, you have the hydrogen atom. Uh, they are usually smaller than organic molecules. They usually dissociate in water to form ions. And remember that an ion is an, an atom with a net electrical charge, whether it be a positive net charge, being a cation or a cation, or a negative net charge, which would be an anion. And inorganic molecules uh, include things like water, oxygen, CO2, and those inorganic salts. Organic substances usually contain carbon and hydrogen, uh, not usually, always contain carbon and hydrogen. Um, they are, are larger than those inorganic molecules, if you recall drawing them back in biology. They do dissolve in water and organic liquids. Uh, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids are the four major groups of organic molecules. So inorganic substances themselves are small compounds that do not contain the atoms carbon and hydrogen. Examples include the inorganic molecules of water, oxygen, CO2, and several are inorganic ions. And you can see this in table 2.6 on page 70 of your textbook. Water itself is a, a polar molecule. And if you recall from polar, remember what makes it polar is that the electrons are being shared unevenly between that oxygen and hydrogen atom. So water is a polar molecule that demonstrates hydrogen bonding and therefore it po uh, possesses some very unique characteristics. Uh, recall hydrogen bonding would be the attraction of a water molecule to a water molecule from uh, molecule A having that slightly negative oxygen atom being uh, uh, bonded to that slightly positive hydrogen atom to water molecule B. So that weak force of attraction there would be that hydrogen bond. Water is an excellent solvent. Uh, many sources uh, uh, are able to be dissolved in water if they are polar. So remember, like dissolves like. So uh, a lot of solutes, many solutes are dissolved in our body's water. Many ionic compounds, such as salts, like sodium chloride, disassociate or break apart in water molecules. Water participates in many chemical reactions in our cells and fluids. Remember that uh, two main reactions when we're looking at biochemical molecules are uh, those reactions called dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. In a dehydration synthesis reaction, it occurs when water is removed from adjacent atoms of molecules to form a bond between them. So you're bringing those monomer subunits that are going to build these larger macromolecule, uh, macromolecules. Uh, water is going to be removed from those monomers, bringing those together to form the polymer. On the reverse end, you have a hydrolysis reaction, and in hydrolysis reactions, uh, which is a decomposition reaction, water is going to be split, and it's going to break the bonds in those polymers to create the individual monomer subunits. Water is an excellent temperature buffer as well, and that's because of water's high specific heat capacity. 
Uh, remember that it takes uh, a great amount of energy either to be released or absorbed by water. So when we talk about energy there, we're looking at heat. And um, basically that energy is going to be absorbed or, re or released very slowly. And therefore that would cause water to only change its temperature very slightly. So you don't have these drastic fluctuations in temperature. So that's a, a unique characteristic of water. Water provides an excellent cooling mechanism when we're looking at the, the human body. Um, because it requires a lot of heat to change water from a liquid to a gas, um, and remember when you're going from a liquid to a gas, that would be referring to a phase state uh, and the, the high heat of vaporization. Um, if water does not change form and evaporate, it leaves a cool surface behind. So this would be part of sweating. And water also serves as a lubricant. And we can see water serving as a lubricant in our mucus, internal organs, and it, it, it is uh, also a lubricant for our joints. And we'll look at that a little bit when we get into articulations. <coughs> so, in summary of water then, water is the most abundant component in cells. It's about 70% of our cells. So, it is very important to uh, living things. We could probably live with uh, about three days without water. Oxygen, O2, uh, oxygen is a gas that is transported by the blood uh, using uh, hemoglobin. It is used to release energy from nutrients during cellular respiration. So if you recall, in when we did cell metabolism and cell respiration, oxygen came in. It was that final electron acceptor. And when oxygen picked up those electrons, it also picked up two protons, which are also known as those hydrogen atoms, or those hydrogen uh, cations, and you form that water molecule. So water being a product of cellular respiration. <clears throat> Next you have carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is also uh, a byproduct of cell respiration. Uh, it needs to be removed from the body. And then there are inorganic salts. Uh, inorganic salts are the sources of many necessary ions. Uh, bicarbonate ions, calcium ions, uh, those will play a role in bone development and blood clotting. Uh, bicarbonate ions uh, play a role in uh, uh, buffering systems. When we talk about uh, maintaining uh, stable internal conditions, homeostasis, as far as the pH scale, so a buffer will help prevent uh, sudden fluctuations in pH. And potassium ions are going to help resting cell membrane potentials. And we'll look talk about uh, resting cell membrane potentials when we get into the nervous system. So, uh, in general then, what can we say is uh, inorganic salts, because of their ability to serve as buffer systems, um, playing a role in, in bone development and blood clotting and also serving in uh, electrical impulses within the nervous system. They play a very important role in metabolism of our body. Organic substances, on the other hand, uh, these contain atoms of carbon and most frequently hydrogen. So these would be our, our molecules that are our chin ops carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And you should recall that from biology. So uh, in general, uh, small molecules called monomers are going to serve as the building blocks that are going to build polymers or macromolecules. Now remember here, because we're talking about organic molecules, we're looking at and, and, and wa uh, yeah, water. Um, carbon, that carbon atom is going to be the central backbone atom to all of these molecules, we're going to be looking at a covalent bond. And that covalent bond could make it either polar or, or non-polar, depending on how those electrons are going to be shared. So we know that water, yeah, why do I keep saying water? We know that these organic molecules can be quite large. Um, uh, and we have the four groups. The four groups would be the carbohydrates, the fats and lipids, the nu uh, nucleic acids, and our amino acids and proteins. 
Water is usually involved in the formation and breakage of bonds uh, between monomers, and we looked at that. Uh, we said dehydration synthesis. Remember, synthesizing, you're building, so a dehydration synthesis reaction is going to build polymers from monomer subunits by removing water, and a hydrolysis reaction is going to break down. It's a decomposition reaction that is going to use water to break down polymers into the monomer subunits. So we know that the, the monomers, uh, when we're looking at, at sugars, uh, the monomers themselves are called monosaccharides, such as glucose and fructose. And then we have uh, disaccharides, which are, are two sugars brought together, two monosaccharides, sucrose and lactose. And then we have polysaccharides, which are large uh, uh, complex chains of monosaccharides that have joined together. And important would be the glycogen and the cellulose. So if we look here is the structure of uh, organic substances that we call carbohydrates. Remember that carbo and hydrate, these are molecules that contain carbon and water. So a lot of them are polar because they have uh, water in their equation. So when we look at, at uh, at carbohydrates themselves, they do contain a CHO ratio that is one, two to one. So one carbon atom to two hydrogen atoms to one oxygen atom. And in glucose, we could see that glucose's molecular formula is C6H12O6. The monomers or building blocks of carbohydrates are called monosaccharides. When you have that six carbon backbone, it's called a hexose sugar. A five carbon backbone would be a pentose sugar. Um, hexose sugars would be glucose, fructose, and uh, uh, galactose. And we know that glucose is our blood sugar, fructose is fruit sugar, and galactose is a component of milk sugar. In the slot on the slide here, you see that you have both the linear and the ring form of carbohydrates. Um, you could have both the straight chain or linear form and ring form forming and, and you remember drawing some of those or should remember drawing some of those back when we did uh, biochemistry. So here you could see the monosaccharide, disaccharide, and polysaccharide. Remember that in disaccharides you have those two monosaccharides that are going to be covalently bonded together via a dehydration synthesis reaction. And then a polysaccharide would be many glucose molecules that are going to be covalently bonded together, um, which, for example, could be starch. Uh, that would be plant storage form of carbohydrate, where glycogen would be animal storage carbohydrate. And remember that uh, that is stored in the liver and in some of our skeletal muscle. Quick go back, uh, functions and energy storage. Uh, basically what we see here with glucose, um, how is the energy that is stored in a carbohydrate released? Remember in, in cell respiration, and we'll look at this in digestion, you have that glucose molecule that is going to come in, you're going to form water and carbon dioxide gas as a byproduct. So in addition to glucose, in order for uh, you to form that water, you need to have oxygen coming in as the final electron acceptor and of course the ultimate output there then would be ATP which is energy. Our next group would be the lipids. Lipids also contain carbon, hydrogen and oxygen but much less oxygen uh, than what we see in carbohydrates. Uh, the types of lipids include fats. Uh, you, you have a fat, uh, the monomer itself the building block is a triglyceride that includes glycerol plus three fatty acids. And you can recall us drawing those uh, back in, in biochemistry when we were looking at um, the dehydration synthesis reaction of a particular fatty acid molecule binding to that glycerol. Uh, remember that the glycerol is, is um, a little bit polar having that oxygen but those fatty acid chains themselves are not polar they are nonpolar because the bond between that carbon and that hydrogen uh, the electrons are going to be shared unevenly creating a nonpolar covalent bond and when we look at that a little bit more 
uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, whether it's going to be soluble or insoluble in water. So when we look at the types of fats, uh, there are those fats that are saturated fats and those sat fats that are unsaturated fats. And in the diagram here, here you can see a saturated fat and down here you can see an unsaturated fat. And remember that the difference between a saturated fat or an unsaturated fat is that carbon-carbon double bond. So when it's fully saturated up here, it's saturated with all hydrogen atoms going around the carbon backbone. Down here, you have two carbon-carbon double bonds there, and therefore you lose spacing for hydrogen to bond to those carbon atoms, because remember, carbon can only bond four times, so therefore that would be an unsaturated fat. So if it was just one carbon-carbon double bond, it would be a monounsaturated fat, but the fact that we have two carbon-carbon double bonds here, it's a polyunsaturated fat. So what is the biggest difference between uh, a saturated and unsaturated fat in addition to the carbon-carbon double bond? In saturated fats, you have only single bonds between the carbon atoms and the fatty acid chain. Uh, they are solid at room temperature. They are animal fat and it includes things such as bacon grease, lard, and butter. Nutritionally, saturated fats are considered the bad fats. Unsaturated fats have one or more double bonds between carbons in their fatty acid chains. So these would be the fatty acid chains. Uh, they are liquid at room temperature. We often call them oils. We think of plant oils or the plant fats such as corn oil, vegetable oil, olive oil, so on and so forth. And we do consider these unsaturated fats as the good fats um, of our diet. You also have those fats that are trans fats, and trans fats themselves, uh, these are unsaturated fats that have been solidified by artificial means. Um, they are not produced nor maintained in the body. Uh, these things include such things as, as margarine, and these are the worst type of fats. So trans fats are, are, are very bad. So functions. Functions of fat, it's uh, uh, as far as, uh, like sugar, it does provide energy, pr provides a lot more energy than, than uh, a sugar molecule, and it's also used not only as an energy source, but as energy storage. So the first type of, of fat that we're going to look at is the phospholipid, and basically a phospholipid is a triglyceride with a substitution of a polar phosphate group, PO4 minus, for one fatty acid chain. So here you can see uh, up here you have that phosphate head, which is going to make it hydrophilic or water loving. These are major components of our cell membranes. Um, they also have that hydrophobic tail. That would be the fatty acid chain portion there. You have steroids. Steroids are four interconnected carbon rings. An example of a steroid would be cholesterol. And the functions compose cell membranes, chemical messengers, and hormones. So hormones play a role in chemical messaging. Uh, you could see uh, compare and contrast triglycerides, phospholipids, and steroids in table 2.7 on page 73 of the textbook. Solubility, hydrophilic, remember again, if we go back to here, hydrophilic means water loving, and because it's water loving, you would say that it's soluble in water, and then the fatty acid portion would be hydrophobic. Hydrophobic means that it would be insoluble in water, or we say lipophilic. And if it's lipophilic, that means it would be soluble in lipids. So these are important in membrane transport uh, when we talk about things crossing over that cell membrane, the phospholipids. So the head is hydrophilic, the tail is hydrophobic, but in opposite of that it would be lipophilic. All right, proteins, a uh, very diverse group. They play a role in structural material, energy source, hormones, receptors, enzymes, antibody. They help build things. 
so on and so forth. Um, the basic structure, you remember that you have that amino group, which is that NHH, and then you have uh, a carboxyl group, C double bond O, OH, and then you have the remainder group, and that's how the 20 amino acids are different from one another. It's that, that remainder group or that side chain group from the amino group or the carboxyl group that's going to make all of those amino acids a little different from one another. Polymers are formed by dehydration synthesis between amino groups of one amino acid and the carboxyl group of the second amino acid. And when you have that dehydration synthesis reaction occurring, so here we could see here, you're going to lose the OH and the H here. You're going to bring two of those together and you're going to form a dipeptide. Three together would be a tripeptide. More than that, you'd start creating a polypeptide. If you have a chain of 100 or more amino acids coming together, then you're in the range of a, pol a polymer that would become a functional enzyme. So uh, peptides are 2 to 100 amino acids. Polypeptide protein is 100 to thousands of amino acids that are going to have that specific function. And then as you start to add on more and more of those amino acids, you start to have those four levels of protein structure coming into play. So if we look at, at, at the um, functions of protein, you could say that the structure, of course, uh, structural proteins would be keratin in hair, nails, and skin. You could have transport proteins, such as hemoglobin, which is going to transport oxygen in our red blood cells. You have chemical messengers, such as hormones and neurotransmitters, that are going to be uh, protein-based. Uh, you have proteins that play a role in movement, such as actin and myosin in the muscles. And we'll talk about that when we look at muscle contraction uh, and immunity. We have proteins that play a role in defense called antibodies. And then, of course, you have uh, proteins that play a role in metabolism uh, that help speed up reactions as catalyst and biological catalyst are going to be called enzymes. Uh, biological catalysts themselves are going to increase the rate of the chemical reaction without being consumed by that reaction because that, they lower that energy of activation barrier. So proteins are built from those amino acids and we know that there are levels of protein structure and of course you'd have the first level of protein structure being the primary level and the primary level, recall that it's just that sequence chain of amino acids. And then what happens that as you get more and more of those amino acids binding, uh, being added onto that uh, polymer, what's going to happen is you're going to start to get interactions between those amino acids, and it's going to start causing that primary structure to twist, like a helix, an alpha helix, um, and, and a spiral there. So you get interactions there due to hydrogen bonding. Uh, sometimes you get sulfide bridges that will form there. Uh, but when you start getting a lot of those disulfide bridges, then what's going to happen there is you're going to start going in that tertiary structure. So you get that folding of the amino acid chain at the secondary level due to the ionic bonds, disulfide bridges, and hydrophobic interactions there and it's basically going to cause it to kind of jumble up and, and twist all about and, and take on a more uh, what I say in class is, is you get that slinky structure that now starts to fold over on itself and becomes all kinked and then of course you have the quaternary structure and this would be the interaction between different amino acid chains um, if you take, for example, if you look at figure 14.8 on page 533, you can see that hemoglobin is composed of four amino acid chains that are condensed into a functional quaternary structure. When we look at, at protein structure itself, remember that proteins, it, it is important for uh, homeostasis to be maintained because when you start to come out of either the pH range or the temperature range, so on and so forth, for protein structure, then you could destroy the protein. And we talk about uh, proteins being destroyed. That would be uh, the denaturation of proteins. So you get the loss of that three-dimensional conformation 
or shape of the protein where it starts to unravel itself and basically the protein itself will then lose its function. Uh, we see this with extreme pH values. Um, so we need to consider uh, where in the body this enzyme or whatever the protein is is located and what is the optimal pH range uh, for that. So blood pH is is very different from the pH of our stomach acids or gastric juices. We also need to take consideration temperature values. So at what temperatures do our enzymes work best at? Uh, harsh chemicals that could play a role in disrupting uh, our, uh, the bonding patterns seen in the levels of protein structure and also high salt concentrations uh, could interrupt uh, the, the levels of protein structure. So there we're going to be looking at uh, uh, osmotic relationships and uh, what osmotic pressures do our enzymes work, work best at within our cells. Our last group would be the nucleic acids. Nucleic acids, the monomer subunits are those nucleotides. Uh, the nucleotide has three basic parts. You have the pentose sugar um, if that is the nucleotide in DNA, that pentose sugar would be deoxyribose. The pentose sugar in the RNA molecule would be ribonucleic uh, acid. So uh, you would have that, that ribose there serving as the pentose sugar. So remember that a pentose sugar is a 5-carbon sugar. Also attached to that, you have the nitrogenous bases. Uh, you have those that are purines, which are double-ringed nitrogenous bases and those that are pyrimidines which are single ringed uh, nitrogenous bases and then of course you have that functional group so when we look at nucleic acids our polynucleotides built from the nucleotides themselves or the mononucleotides are going to be DNA and RNA and DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid and it's a double polynucleotide and its uh, close relative there would be RNA, the ribonucleic acid, and that's a single uh, polynucleotide. So we know that polymers are formed by the uh, bonding between the sugar of one nucleotide and the phosphate group of a second nucleotide, and therefore you get that uh, creation of a sugar phosphate backbone. And you can think of that when we do the uh, DNA song. So alternating sugar phosphate, and then you have the base. And when you look at the DNA molecule, which is pictured on this side, on the right side of the screen, uh, you could see that you have an interaction between one chain and another, and the nitrogenous bases there are interacting with one another. That would be hydrogen bonding, holding those two molecules together. Um, as far as deoxyribonucleic acid DNA, pictured to the right. Uh, the structure itself, you have the sugar deoxyribose, those nitrogenous bases in the DNA molecule will be adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. It's double-stranded, so it resembles a ladder or railroad tracks, and the strands are held together by hydrogen bonds. Remember that DNA molecules, they bond according to complementary base pairing, such as stated by Erwin Chargaff, um, so adenine complements thymine, and therefore you'd have two hydrogen bonds between those two. And cytosine is going to complement guanine, and therefore you get three hydrogen bonds between those. It is a double helix, and its function overall is, is it is the genetic material. So that is, it is what our genes and our chromosomes are made of. And DNA is going to direct protein synthesis. So if you recall that chapter... Uh, back in, in biology called transcription and tr translation when we did protein synthesis. So DNA contains all necessary information needed to sustain and reproduce life. Our other molecule there would be ribonucleic acid. And ribonucleic acid, its structure, you have the sugar ribose, and we see this here to the left. So we have that ribose pentose sugar. The bases would be adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. Remember that RNA does not have thymine. It has uracil instead. It is a single-stranded molecule, 
and its function is to transport the DNA code during protein synthesis. And in doing so, remember that we have those three different RNA molecules. You have ribosomal RNA or rRNA. You have transport RNA or tRNA, transfer RNA. And then you also have, uh, um, oh, I got a block here, uh, mRNA, which is messenger RNA. So those would be the three RNA molecules. So that is pretty much it for our chapter on chemical basis of life. So this would be chapter two, looking at both uh, basic chemistry and a little bit of biochemistry there. Um, it was only two lectures as a uh, means of review of basic biology concepts and basic chemistry concepts that are going to play an important role in anatomy and physiology. Thank you everyone and have a great day.